back on. Now, it turns out that this upside down living is um, leading straight to national bankruptcy. If, if you think about it in very general terms, if you have the, the normal pyramid, it's dominated by gifts and barter and, and, and tribute, which are part of the local economy. Everything circulates locally. And if you have some imports through trade, then that's just the, the tip, the very tip of the pyramid, the very top, reserved for luxury goods and, and, and some other things that, that you can't get locally that you absolutely need. But, but imports are restricted and, and uh, they don't dominate. So y you can get anything you want just by calling in favors or receiving gifts, etc. You're not completely dependent on um, the outside world, as it were. In the upside down way of living, you have a flood of imports from low wage countries that dominates the economy. And the global economy dominates the, the entire uh, top of the upside down pyramid, with the local economy squeezed down to the bottom. And the most important thing to note is that the upside down mode is only possible while constantly taking on debt. The moment your credit lapses. The moment you can no longer expand your credit, you go bankrupt. Your access to imports is lost. And then what you have left is the tiny little triangle at the bottom to, to provide you with everything you need to survive. Now, the question of debt is, is kind of a general question. Uh, interest used to be illegal. It's banned in the Bible. It's, it's illegal in Muslim countries. It's, um, it's generally a bad idea. And um, the idea of charging interest on loans is what all of our modern commerce and banking is, um, is based on. It presupposes sustained exponential growth because that's what compound interest is. And it, it's just an awful idea. It, it's, it's pretty brain dead. And the reason is that exponential growth in anything anywhere only produces one result, which is collapse. And the reason for that is that exponential growth outpaces any sustainable physical process in the universe outside of a few freak cases like a sustained nuclear explosion. <laughs> where the entire universe blows up and then we don't know what happens. <laughs> so just to explain to you how bad an idea it is, let me throw out the most outlandish example available. If you can't beat this, then, then I, I think that it proves the point. Suppose we solve every single technical problem on Earth and then we go on and, and found space colonies and take over the solar system and the galaxy and other galaxies and the entire universe. So suppose we have a space empire and also we, we tackle the problem of space travel so we can e expand this empire almost at the speed of light. You, you know, you can't go faster than the speed of light um, because a mass accelerated to the speed of light would have to have infinite energy. Um, so then it turns out that our space colony can only expand as approxi appro approximately as time cubed because space is three-dimensional, uh, while our debt that, you know, the money that we had to borrow in order, in order to, to form this empire would grow as debt raised to t, which is time, which is exponential growth, d to the t. And if you play with the math a little bit, as t increases, d to the t becomes greater than t, thir t cubed for any value of d. That is, geometric growth is slower than exponential growth. It's a mathematical property. Now, what can you do about it? Well, suppose if you're a Star Trek fan and you believe in warp speed, you know, like warp 10 or whatever, which is faster than the speed of light. You think that would solve the problem? No, it wouldn't. No, that just changes the, uh, changes the number that, that you raise to, to, to the third power. And uh, in fact, nothing would fix this problem other than inventing a time machine and going back in time and settling your debts. So that's about the only thing that solves the problem, and that's not in the works. 
So here's a little plot, you know, just a little graphing cal calculator that, that shows you your debt is in red, uh, your uh, space colony is, is in, in black, and your deficit is in blue. So a little bit of time goes on, and then your deficit skyrockets, and for all intents and purposes becomes infinite. So interest is a bad idea, and any interest, even 0.1% is a bad idea and leads to collapse. But if you have 7% a year, then you get Bernie Madoff. That's the difference. It's, it's a qualitative difference, not a quantitative one. Now, interest lending is, is kind of an interesting thing because it causes moral issues and difficulties, not just financial ones. So if you, if you lend at 0%, then that's actually not necessarily all bad. So if you have $100 sitting around and a friend of yours thinks of planting some apple trees, you can lend them $100, and then when the apple trees start bearing fruit, you get your $100 back. Plus, you might get some apples. So that's the reason to lend. It's the apples. It's not the $100, because there's no interest on it. So that's a reasonable scheme. The only reason you do that is in the expectation of getting something useful, apples, for something useless, $100 that you're not currently using. Now, lending with interest creates artificial interest in lending for things that are of no use to you personally, such as houses that you don't live in and don't even visit because somebody else is living in them that you don't know, cars that you won't get to drive or the person who buys the car will, won't even give you a ride, and of course capital for companies that offshore your jobs, you know, that's where your savings go. Um, so as soon as you give money to an institution that uses interest, um, you're basically doing things that are not necessarily helping you. They're helping somebody, but not necessarily you. And also, uh, interest um, introduces this uh, concept of risk premium. So, for instance, uh, Greek debt is more expensive than American debt. I don't know why. Um, and I think that's just power of inertia than any, more than anything else. But you say, instead of saying, oh, we're not going to lend any money to Greece because they can't repay their debts. Well, instead, what we pay is, we will charge a higher interest on Greek debt because it's riskier. So when you do that, eventually the whole economy becomes a bad credit risk and collapses. It's inevitable. So I think the outcome is perfectly predictable. Collapse is baked in into the scheme. It's guaranteed to occur. It, it is unavoidable. Now, what, what people seem to want to ask me a lot, and recently some, some money men took me out to dinner, and they bought me dinner, which was nice, and entertained me with some conversation, but they really wanted to know the timing of collapse because they want to time the market. They, <laughs> they want to run away with all the chips, even if those chips are worthless, because that's how their mind works. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I got all the chips. Too bad the casino is closed. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but you know, they paid for dinner, so that was okay. Um, but, but timing is completely irrelevant. The only thing you should be paying attention to is the fact that it is not too late for you to do things to prepare. And don't, don't think further than the next project that you can actually take on. Um, but most importantly, I think a, a cultural flip is needed to, to change from these impersonal, commercialized relationships that involve strangers to personal relationships based on personal trust and, and the people that you actually know. So that, that involves getting, getting rid of some false gods. And you know, these uh, faulty ideas have penetrated a lot of people's minds and you know, polluted them. Uh, the free market is considered efficient, efficient and optimal, for instance, and, and uh, a lot of people think that the unhindered market will pro spontaneously produce prosperity without end. And as it happens, the free market is a little bit better than a planned economy at chewing through all of the non-renewable resources and then spontaneously collapsing. So. You know, the Soviet Union was less efficient, so it collapsed first. That's it. 
That's all you get. That's all the benefit that you get as you collapse a little bit later because you're slightly more efficient. And so most of what you've been taught relating to economics has to do with the, the growth economy, which is over. And, and so people keep going on about this economic system that no longer exists and is irrelevant. And, and they have to understand that they've been given a bunch of ideology and, and, and a, basically a fake religion, uh, not science. And, and, and they should just get rid of this baggage because it's not helpful. Now, part of that baggage is this belief in efficiency, and it's a, it's a really nasty word, it turns out, because anybody can use it to mean anything, it turns out. So it's more efficient to offshore industrial production to low-wage countries, right? Economic efficiency, you get more profit, and, and so that's more efficient. And it's, of course, more efficient to replace little mom-and-pop sho shops and specialty shops with big-box stores like Walmart. Uh, that uh, feature lower prices, right? It's more efficient to pay less and get more. And of course, it's more efficient to close these big, big box stores when, when the, the customers are all broke <laughs> because their jobs have been offshored to make the stuff that's cheap, okay? And after that, of course, it is more efficient for the government to just basically uh, demolish the towns and, and foreclose everyone and ship them out and, and, and pretend it never happened. So energy efficiency, you might think it's some kind of a special case which deserves more attention and uh, people often say, well, we must become more efficient. Well, not really, because if you look at efficient systems, they're more fragile, they're less resilient, they're, they're more tweaked, let's say. They're more, they're more highly optimized and every step in an optimization process makes the system more fragile, makes it more highly adjusted to its circumstances. Um, now, if you look at resilient systems, they operate nowhere near their capacity, and, and, and they're generally insensitive to things like quality and quantity of inputs. Um, they're not highly specialized. So you might have um, the example of a cat, which can eat just about any, any kind of an animal. Um, you know, it, it'll eat a cow if you help it. And <laughs> And, but, but it'll also eat a vole, and that's fine. Um, and mostly it sleeps because, you know, what, what happens if the food runs short? Well, it'll sleep one hour a day less, you know, and hunt one hour a day more. And, and so it's very well adjusted to, uh, to just about anything. And then if you compare it to a, a highly specialized, uh, fine-tuned, efficient system, it will, you will find that it relies on very specific inputs, and it operates very close to the point of failure. That is, if it's, it's efficient for just one little disturbance or one thing going wrong, and it just all breaks down. The example is a hummingbird, which has to hover from, from flower to flower and feed on it, or it starves to death in a matter of hours. So a uh, technical example is electronic fuel injection. Uh, in, in cars, which is more efficient than a carbureted engine, but the problem that we found just recently is one little earthquake and tsunami knocks out every single uh, fuel injector um, control circuit in the universe. So suddenly we can't make cars anymore. So it turns out that you know old carburetors that you know I know how to take apart and put together are in some way more resilient than hyper-efficient fuel-injected cars that re require a Japanese component from a factory that's now closed. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back to gift economies. Uh, there, there's uh, actually quite a bit of uh, research on this. Uh, one French scholar, Marcel Mauss, did quite a bit of research on it. And it turns out that just about every culture in the world started out as a gift economy, where, where it didn't have commerce. They have, ba they have basically exchange of gifts, and examples span just about every community in, in the world, old community in the world. Um, it's very well suited to surviving hard times, because if you think about commerce, and especially commerce based on contracts, um, anytime times go bad, you get endless breach of contract and litigation. So like the foreclosure crisis is, is a prime example. 
the, the economy tipped in the wrong direction and suddenly you have breach of contract all over the place. So this is something you don't have in a gift economy. If somebody can't return the favor of, of the gift that you gave them, then they can't. So what are you going to do? If, if, if you expect somebody to give you a